Well, hello and welcome back and thanks again for joining us for the final session of Secrets of Prophecy. I can't believe that we, uh, we are actually here, but after a few weeks of recordings and, uh, and showing this series on YouTube over the last uh, six weeks or so, we are here at the final program. Well, uh, in uh, today's session, we're going to be looking at two different topics. The first one being why there are so many churches. And the second one, you don't want to miss that as well. It is entitled The Secret to Success. So the first topic, why so many churches? You know, when we look around the world today, uh, the world just seems to be getting more and more crazy, doesn't it? Uh, with various things done in the name of religion. In fact, uh, you know, we've seen too many deaths that have been motivated by religion just in the last decade or two. But uh, really, it's nothing new. And uh, here we can see a sketch from 1669. I mean, we're talking like, you know, more than 300 years ago here, a sketch by uh, Jean Ledger uh, showing the killing of Christian heretics. So clearly, this is, uh, this is nothing new in the world that we live in. In fact, it is estimated that about 50 million people were killed simply for belonging to the wrong church throughout the Middle Ages. So today we find ourselves in a world where there are 19 world religions, what you could call world religions, and then these are separated into 270 separate religious groups. And uh, amongst those, when you look just at the Christian uh, part of the world, it's separated into 34,000, more than 34,000 different Christian groups. So it's hard to know, you know, where do I go amongst the plethora of different uh, religious groups that are out there, even amongst the Christian ones, uh, if you're wanting to follow the, uh, the Bible. So the questions that we're looking at here today are, does God have a church for today? for the days that we're living in, particularly for the end times, as the Bible tells us that we are living today in a time that but the Bible calls the time of the end. And if there is a church, which one would it be? And should I join it? Or should I just be an independent believer? So going back to the Bible, the Bible clearly tells us that belonging to God's church is, is an important part of being a follower of Jesus. In Acts chapter 2, Verse 47, we read, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So clearly it's, it's God's work of adding to the church. Then in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, we read, for by one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. So clearly God's intention was for there to ever be only one true church. Uh, so, you know, when we join church, the church clearly is not perfect. The church is made up of people. And where there are people, there are problems, aren't there? You know, in my former life, you could say, uh, I used to be a design engineer and uh, I used to sit at the desk and design things. You know, I used to just draw and calculate and use my computer and do programming and whatnot. And, uh, you know, there was no problems with, you know, it was basically solving problems, but no problems with people per se. But now that I'm in a different line of work, you realize that where there are people, there are problems. And so when we join a church, you know, it's not perfect. There is a sense, obviously, of, uh, of trust, of vulnerability when you join a community of, of people, of humans. And, and sometimes people do get hurt. <clears throat> Excuse me. But according to God's word, one of the most important things for you to do is to experience church because the church is something that... Uh, that Jesus began. So the key benefits of being part of a church are to enhance our own spiritual journey. You know, it's, it's good for us to belong to, a, to a, a community of believers. Also, we can encourage one another in our spiritual journey. And, uh, and also, there's clearly going to be more effective sharing of the good news, the gospel message about Jesus when we're part of a thriving community. You know, it's a difficult thing to be a solo Christian. There's no such thing, really. You can't really be a hermit of a Christian because Jesus has called us into a community of believers. 
So uh, as an eternal principle, you could say you do not go to church to find the truth. You go to the Bible to find the truth. And, uh, and, and then as you find the, the, the truth in the Bible, then you go to a church that teaches that truth. Okay, so you go to the Bible, you find the truth, and then you look around for a church that teaches that truth. Uh, when we look at the last 2,000 years, the history of the Christian church, it's a history of change, isn't it? And we can see in the picture up here, we can see, you know, it starts off clearly the early Christian church, you know, they would have been meeting in people's homes uh, in, in rather smaller gatherings. And then as time progressed, it, it turned into, you know, the church of the, the Middle Ages, you could say, and uh, a lot of pomp and ceremony, etc. And then came the, uh, the Protestant uh, Reformation and, uh, and churches became more, more simple, if you like. But still today, when we look at some of these churches, they're, they're considered to be uh, traditional. And, and then we kind of go to, you know, we have all these mega churches around uh, today and uh, lights and, and action and loud music and all that sort of thing. And, you know, there's been a progression, a change of the, uh, the Christian church. And, and we can see that all around us today. So the church in the Bible is symbolically portrayed as a woman, okay? And uh, so we read in uh, uh, Jeremiah, sorry, uh, chapter six, verse two, that God has likened the daughter of Zion to a lovely, delicate woman. His people are referred to as a woman. And then in 2 Corinthians 11, verse two, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So. So the church, the people of God are, are represented by a woman in the Bible. And in the scriptures, a good woman, the good woman, represents God's true church. Whereas the prostitute, uh, when we look in, in Revelation and other parts of the scriptures, like Hosea, for instance, represents a false church um, where, where God's people have fallen away from the truth. So we see in Revelation 12, verse 1, uh, a, a description of, uh, of the true church uh, of God. Actually, we'll be looking at Revelation chapters 12 and 14 in today's uh, program. But in, in verse 1 of chapter 12, it says, Now a great sign appeared in heaven, and a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. 12 is a good number, by the way, in the Bible. Whenever, you know, God refers to something with the number 12, it's a good number. So clearly this woman, uh, bright, light, etc., it's representing the pure, true church here in Revelation 12, verse 1. And then we see that Satan attempted to destroy the woman and her child, her offspring. And so we see in verse 4, and the dragon stood before the woman and was, who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. We know uh, from history that the devil worked through people, uh, through governors and uh, through, through armies, etc., uh, to try to destroy Jesus even as soon as he was born. Uh, then later on, clearly, you know, the, uh, the people, the devil, through the people again, worked uh, to crucify Jesus. Uh, however, Jesus was victorious. And that's the good news. Jesus rose from the grave. His mission was accomplished. He, uh, he was victorious over sin and over death. And so the devil was defeated. He was judged at the cross. And today, the devil is basically defeated. So, who then did the devil attack after he failed to destroy Jesus? Uh, it would make sense that if, if the devil can't get it at the Lord anymore, who's he going to get? He's going to get those who follow him. And so we read in Revelation 12, verse 13, Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. So this woman that represents the true church is the one that the, the dragon or the devil is so furious with, and he wants to destroy God's church. And so we see in the early days of the Christian church movement, we see that all of the, uh, the apostles pretty much died a martyr's death. We see Matthew, uh, and here we have the summary here of the various apostles, Matthew, 
uh, he was martyred, being slain by the sword in Ethiopia. And uh, some of these clearly are taken from, from history and, uh, uh, and have been recorded uh, through tradition as well. So Mark died in Alexandria after being cruelly dragged through the streets of the city. Luke was hanged on an olive tree in Greece. Peter was crucified with his head downwards. He didn't want to be crucified in the same way as his Lord. John was put in a boiling, in, into boiling oil, but miraculously he escaped and later he was uh, banished uh, to the island of Patmos. James the Great was beheaded in Jerusalem. Then James the Less was thrown from the temple and beaten to death with a club. Uh, Bartholomew was flayed alive. You know, gruesome deaths that these, uh, these apostles went through. Andrew was bound to a cross from where he preached to his persecutors until he died. Thomas uh, was run through his body with a lance in, uh, in East India. Uh, then Jude was shot to death with arrows. And Paul, as we know, spent uh, uh, many, many places. He was persecuted at, uh, as he went around in his missionary journeys. And finally, he, was, uh, he had his last days in prison. And then eventually he was beheaded in Rome by the Emperor Nero. And so um, instead of uh, destroying God's church, which the devil tried to do, he tried to destroy the leaders initially, um, instead of destroying it, the, uh, the, the church, the original Christian church, the early Christian church just grew. So despite uh, the, the martyrdom, the, it was like a catalyst, if you like, the seeds, for the growth of the Christian church. And, uh, and so then the devil, I guess, changed his tactics. You know, they say, if you can't beat them, join them. And so Satan decided that if he couldn't destroy the church, he would join it and corrupt it from the inside. And that's what we saw in a previous program. So during the Middle Ages, the church basically fell away from the truth that was in the early Christian church. And so Paul writes in 2 Thessalonians, 2 verse 3, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come, meaning the, day, the, the end day, the, the, the day of the return of Jesus, that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. So Paul knew that you know, many people in the early Christian church believed that Jesus would return in their lifetime. But Paul knew it was still some way off because he knew that there would have to be a falling away first. And of course, John writes about that too uh, in Revelation, the falling away of the church. And so here we see uh, mapped out uh, the, the falling away, if you like, through the Middle Ages of, uh, of the church. And, and so we have in 321 AD, uh, the church, when it, when it unified with, with the pagans, uh, we see that Sunday, uh, was instituted as the day of worship. Then uh, 325 AD, we have Easter, which comes from the Babylonian goddess Ishtar. And then we have, uh, you know, Christ Mass, which comes in from the Babylonian sun god Tammuz uh, on December the 25th. Then we have, uh, in 376 AD, the Pope becomes Pontifex Maximus, which was, uh, you know, um, the, the name that was given to the emperors before as well. In 381 AD, we have the worship of Mary instituted. 416 AD, we have infant baptism brought into the church, which wasn't there earlier. 783 AD, we have the worship of images and saints and the dead, praying to the dead, etc. Uh, 813 AD, the mass and the transubstantiation, where you know it, it was believed that the actual body and blood of Jesus was there. At the, at the time of, of the ordinances, the, the, the communion. Uh, and uh, in 1123 AD, we see the celibacy of, of the priests and we can see that, uh, you know, the trouble that that has brought over the, over the ages. Then in 1215 AD, the annual confession to the priests, you know, the Bible tells us that we need to, we need to confess our sins to God, not to another human. Uh, and the 1229 AD, Bible reading was forbidden by regular lay people. Uh, 1229 AD, uh, the, uh, the Roman uh, church head of the Pope claimed supremacy over all leaders. And in 1439 AD, purgatory basically becomes a dogma 
and in 1545 AD, tradition is declared equal to the Bible. Uh, and so we see this falling away that Paul has written about. And so what happened to the true church during that time? The Bible tells us that the church fled into the wilderness during this time of the Dark Ages. We read in Revelation chapter 12, verses 6 and 14, then that the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God. That's in verse 6. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished. Uh, in verse 14, we read that. So, so basically, the true believers went into hiding during that time. You know, when it was illegal, if you like, to worship God according to what was in the scriptures, the people that wanted to continue to practice according to the faith of the Bible had to go into hiding. Now, the Bible tells us how long they would need to be in hiding for. It tells us there that uh, the time there would be 1260 years. And we looked this, at this in a different uh, program as well, where in different places in Daniel and Revelation, this time period is referred to as a time, times and half a time or 42 months or 1260 days. And so, um, and so this time period, it's a very long time period. And it's really during this time of, of the Middle Ages. And, uh, and during this time, the Bible tells us that they should feed her there for 1260 days where she is nourished for a time, times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. And, uh, and so towards the end of that time, the Reformation movement began to swell and, um, and, and, you know, light began to come forth uh, that had been hidden for centuries earlier. And so we read here that a passion for the truth emerged in the lives of men such as uh, Martin Luther and uh, John Wycliffe, John Calvin, John Haas, etc. Many of these men lost their lives uh, for their faith. The Bible uh, was translated at this time into the language of the common people because, because the liturgy had previously been all in Latin in a language that people generally didn't understand. And uh, it was forbidden for them to read the Bible for so long anyway. So the people didn't know any better than what the church told them. But now the Bible had been translated into a language that they could understand. And so there was, there was light that began, began to, to come forth as they, they began to read these truths. And so people understood the Bible and the prophecies in the Bible. They understood the gospel, the good news about Jesus. And, uh, and at this time, Rome rejected this whole movement as a heresy. But uh, the spark for the, the Reformation had been lit and it just continued on from, uh, from that time. And so the revelation of truth, just as the fall into darkness was progressive, the revelation of truth into light was also a progression. And so this is one reason why there are so many Christian churches today. Because uh, as, uh, as the Reformation movement began, you know, some, some of the reformers and believers would discover new light and then they would stop there. And then even though new light was discovered after that, they didn't want to progress further. They just stayed in the light that had been revealed earlier. And so today we see a number of different, you know, major denominations around, around the world. So the spirit of the Reformation, really, it continued through the world until the church of God emerged in the last days, what the Bible calls the time of the end, a church that returned to the original teachings of the Bible and the Christian church. And so you can see here another progression, if you like, from you know, the Orthodox Church, which was about a thousand years ago, where they, they established a church with no Pope. And then uh, the United Brethren of the 1500s uh, established the authority of the Bible. You know, that was their thing. And then the Church of England, well, they abolished the, uh, the images and uh, the idols, if you like, uh, the idolatry and, and the, the worship and the prayers to the Mary and, and the saints, etc., and then you've got the Lutheran church with Martin Luther, who, who, um, 
who found, you know, that salvation is by faith through the grace of God. And then you've got the Presbyterian Church also in the 1500s, uh, and they were for a practical Christianity instead of a formal religion. Then you've got the, the, the Baptists came along with Bible baptism by immersion. Then you've got the Methodist Church in the 1700s where, you know, they, they, uh, they were for a separation of, of church and state and a belief in, in the Ten Commandments and obedience to, to God. Then you've got the Advent movement in, uh, in the 1800s, and many people refer to this as the, the second great awakening. The first great awakening was the, with the whole Reformation movement, but then there was the second great awakening where, where people began to say, hey, you know, we're living in the time of the end and Jesus is coming soon. And then after this Advent movement, then there came the, the Seventh Day Adventist movement, which, uh, which then uh, established the Sabbath, for instance, and began preaching this end time message that Revelation chapter 14 talks about. And uh, it is referred to as the three angels messages of Revelation uh, 14. And so what's the devil's attitude then towards God's church in the last days? We read in Revelation 12, 17, that the dragon was enraged. He's angry with the woman and particularly he went to make war with the rest of her offspring. You know, if you look at the Christian church as a set, if you like, then there is a subset, okay? So you've got the whole Christian church, which, uh, which today is, you know, probably over 2 billion people worldwide. But you've got a subset group here, which uh, the Bible tells us the, the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of of Jesus. He's particularly angry with this group. So the devil is angry with this remnant, if you like, the rest of her offspring, uh, which is the last day church, the end time church that God has raised up with a special message for the world. So what are the identifying marks for God's final church? Uh, it is outlined in Revelation chapter 12 and chapter 14. You know, one time I met a man and he was telling me how he's originally from New Zealand, lives in Australia today. But he, he told me about how when he was a younger man, he, he went from this church and to that church. And to, he went to about five different churches. And then finally, when he realized what the Bible says here in Revelation chapters 12 and 14, he didn't have to go anywhere else because it was very clear that God had an end time church and, uh, and he joined it. So... In Revelation 12, 17, we, we read about how this dragon is enraged with the woman, with the true church. He goes off to make war with the rest of her offspring, those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. So this is a very key verse here that, uh, that establishes who these people are that, uh, that worship God in the end time and have a particular message for the, for the world. You know, I myself believe that, uh, that God has provided uh, clear characteristics to help us identify his end time church. God doesn't want us to be confused. God doesn't want us to be wandering around and thinking, you know, which church should I join? Or maybe I'll just join that church because it feels good. Or I'll join that church because my friends go there. No, God wants you to understand from the Bible which church has the characteristics that he uh, he wants you to follow. And so I myself believe that the Seventh-day Adventist church believes that God, uh, you know, he has people in all different churches, all denominations. God has faithful people. However, he is specially raised up the Seventh-day Adventist church movement, uh, which I'm a part of, to represent him and his final message in a particular time and that is the time that the bible refers to as the time of the end so in the end times so remember as an eternal principle as i mentioned before you don't go to a church to find the truth you go to the bible to find the truth and when you find the truth then you look for for a church that teaches the teaching that you find and that is truth according to the Bible. So I'm going to look at a number of clues here today. The first clue is that uh, the God's church that went into hiding during this period of time of 1260 years 
it will rise up at the end of this prophecy or sometime after it. And, uh, and so we see that uh, the end of this prophecy comes in the year 1798. And, uh, and so sometime after this, the church would come forth. And, uh, and so there is um, uh, evidence that, you know, the church uh, can trace its, 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 its uh, beliefs back um, through church history, through the wilderness, right back to the early church. Uh, and it was in hiding. However, it emerged and, uh, and, and was organized after this period of hiding. And that's, that's where the, the Advent movement, where the Second Great Awakening happened in the early 1800s. And ultimately, that led to the official organization of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in 1863. Now, um, the second clue is that uh, this church would have the faith of Jesus. According to uh, Revelation 12, 17, it has the faith of Jesus. So, uh, and uh, the Seventh-day Adventist church really is a continuation of the Reformation. The Reformation never really stopped. You know, it kept going. And so through a philosophy of taking the Bible and the Bible only, which was the, the Protestant mantra, uh, as a rule of faith, it has restored the major truths of the original Christian church. The third clue is it would teach uh, and preach the everlasting gospel according to Revelation 14, verses 6 and 12. And, uh, you know, the Seventh-day Adventist church believes in salvation by faith through the grace of God. You know, nobody, we believe, nobody will ever be saved apart from the grace of God. And, uh, and salvation is 100% based on the sacrifice and merits of Jesus. It's not by our works or anything that we can contribute or do towards uh, having, getting salvation. It is a free gift of God. The fourth clue is in Revelation 12, verse 17 and 14, verse 12, it says that this end time church would be a commandment keeping people. And, uh, you know, many people uh, today will say, well, you know, the commandments have been done away with. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the verse there in Revelation chapter 14 and chapter 12, they both say that this, uh, this end time church would be a commandment keeping people. Uh, Revelation 12, 17, it says, uh, those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. And uh, in Revelation 14, verse 12, it says, here are the patience. Uh, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And of course, you know, um, one of the unique, um, one of the unique commandments, you know, many people say, well, you know, I don't have a problem with the commandments, just the fourth one. Uh, and so one of the unique things with the Seventh-day Adventist movement is it has restored God's Seventh-day Sabbath, which is all through the, the scriptures. And um, the fifth clue is it would have an end time message. And in Revelation 14, uh, verses 6 through 12, it has these three key messages that need to go out to the whole world. And, uh, and this has been the focal point, really, of the Seventh-day Adventist movement. It has been the, uh, you know, the marching orders, if you like, of going out to the world with a special message uh, that, uh, that God wants to have preached before the second coming of Jesus. And so the final warning message in these three, uh, three angels' messages was worship the creator God and give glory to him because judgment has begun. And so as we saw in a previous program, the judgment is taking place right now before the second coming of Jesus. And so we need to return to a faith in the Lord that honors him as the creator. And so we go right back to Genesis where, where God established his, his Sabbath day, even before, uh, before the giving of the commandments, for instance, before sin uh, came in. Then the second message is that Babylon has fallen. Babylon really represents the, uh, the confusion of religion out there. He says, you know, all, all of this is fallen. And the third one is to avoid the mark of the beast, to avoid following Babylon. And each of these messages seems to get more serious and loud as, as God tries to get the attention 
of people. So clue number six also is regarding life and death. You know, sin has brought death into this world and God wants us to understand about both life and death. And so one of the most important teachings that the Seventh-day Adventist Church uh, believes is the concept of death as a sleep. And uh, at death, the person remains in the grave simply until the resurrection morning when, uh, when Christ returns and calls forth those who are, are saved. And said, so then clue number seven is that it will be a global movement preaching all over the world, according to Revelation 14, verse six. And uh, today, uh, the, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is, is probably the most widespread Protestant denomination being actively involved in over 215 countries around the world, virtually in every country in the world, um, even though you know there may be a handful or a dozen countries where it may not officially be present because simply because uh, the governments of, of those countries don't allow for it. But there are believers in those countries. And uh, today there are publications uh, that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has in over a thousand different languages. Then clue number eight is it would be a prophetic movement. Now, according to uh, Revelation 12, verse 17, it says here, that not only will, will this church be a commandment keeping people, but it also says that they will have the testimony of Jesus. Now, if we go to Revelation 19 and, uh, and verse 10, it says here that uh, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And so we believe then that uh, that. God leads his people through the, a prophetic voice. And so we believe that not only is the movement a prophetic one coming up through, uh, through Reve Revelation chapter 10, it talks about the study of, of the little book that was closed. It was sealed and then it was opened. Uh, this talks about the book of Daniel. As people began to study the books of Daniel and Revelation together, they, they went through a great disappointment. It says there in Revelation 10 that uh, it was sweet as honey in the mouth, but it, then when it was ingested, it became bitter. And that's what happened to this early Advent movement of the Second Great Awakening. It went through a great disappointment. And so the Adventist church began really um, ultimately from a disappointment. But really, the Christian church in itself also started with a disappointment. Uh, you know, if you were to ask somebody um, which religious leader, which major world leader would have been thought to have made the least impact upon his death, you would probably say it would be Jesus Christ because look at the way that he died. And yet today, you know, a, a quarter, more than a quarter of the world follow Jesus Christ. And, and so it, the Christian movement itself started, if you like, with a disappointment. And it was the same with the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It started from a disappointment and, and the people there began searching for the truths in, in the scriptures. Also, one of the things that, uh, that we believe is that it is led through a prophetic voice through, uh, that was given from God for, particularly for the end times. And so within the church, we believe that God raised up a special messenger right after this, this disappointment. And the, uh, the voice came through a prophetic a voice through Ellen G. White. And uh, she was one of, she wasn't the pioneer of the church, but she was one of them. And um, the writings do not replace the Bible at all but support and uplift Jesus and uplift the Bible as a special focus uh, for people living in the end time. And so, you know, for instance, one of the things that she wrote about today is something that the world is still catching up on. And that is all the different things she wrote about health and well-being. Today, uh, as we are living through a pandemic, people are particularly concerned about their health and well-being. Well, this lady who had very little education wrote about health and well-being, things that scientists are still catching up to today. And that's probably why Seventh-day Adventists for a long time, if they're faithful to the things that have been revealed, live on average 10 years longer 
than the average person and have good health. And so God wants you to live an abundant life, my friends, and uh, he wants you to have good health. You know, in Ephesians chapter four, it says that there is one body, one and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So I believe that God wants to have one church, one true church here on this earth. God wants one church that is based on the pillars of truth, you know, on Jesus, on the word of God and on obedience to the Lord on the Ten Commandments. Uh, you know, in John chapter 10, verse 16, Jesus himself said that other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring and they will hear my voice and there will be one flock and one shepherd. So Jesus himself recognized that people are in all different sort of faiths, if you like, but there are true believers in all faiths. And ultimately, when those true believers hear the truth of God's word, they will follow the voice of Jesus. Sometimes we think that if we're in a particular church, we can go and reform that church. Well, the Bible doesn't call us to do that. It just says, if you are in a false uh, worshiping movement, you need to come out of there. Revelation 18.4 is this fourth angel's message, if you like, that comes right at the last uh, time there. And, uh, and God's warning there, to people in Babylon, people that are in confusion, okay, those who are outside God's end time movement. And it says there, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. So again, God says, you know, I have my people in all different faiths. But the catch uh, cry there is, the word is, you know, come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues, talking about the uh, the seven last plagues there. You know, God doesn't want anybody to be lost and he wants people to come out and worship him. Jesus uh, warned us in Matthew 15 verse nine, in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You know, sometimes we've belonged to a church for a long time and we've not realized that the things that that church teaches are simply a tradition things that came into the church that were never in the church, but they came in through the Middle Ages, through the Dark Age time. And so Jesus said, you know, we need to teach according to the Bible. We need to teach according to the Word of God, according to the commandments of God. And if we, we don't teach according to that, then in vain is our worship. You know, soon there will only be two global religions. One will worship and obey Jesus in truth, and the other will worship and obey religious powers of the world. And so, my friends, now is the time to hear the call of Jesus and, and come out and, uh, and choose to follow the Lord and his last day church. Some time ago, I remember uh, talking to someone and he shared this story about a, uh, a beautiful lady who was a Sunday school teacher. And, uh, and she... Uh, would go along and she would teach the children each week. And she loved to do that. Then she came along to a series of seminars, just like these ones here that we've, we've been putting on, on, uh, on YouTube. And uh, she, she shared, uh, she, she, she heard, sorry, she heard the truths that you've been hearing as you've been listening to this series. She was convicted in her heart that they were true, but she didn't want to leave her family and her beloved, you know, children and, and the community that she'd been with for decades. And, uh, and so she continued to go along to the Sunday school, but she began to teach the children uh, the things that she learned at the seminars, including uh, she began to teach them that, uh, that they were worshiping on the wrong day. Uh, of course, you know, the parents got upset, everyone got upset. And uh, really, she was doing the wrong thing. She thought that by going along there, she would be doing the right thing. She was trying to have one foot in one camp and one foot in the other camp. But really, she wasn't doing anybody a service. She was rather doing a disservice. In Romans chapter 2, verse 13, we read, For not the hearers of the Lord are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. And so, you know, when we know the truth, 
we want to follow the truth. We, we, we want to do the truth. We not just believe it, but actually do it and follow it. And that way people can actually follow your example. Similarly, we read in James chapter 1, verse 22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Friends, when this lady uh, heard that the Bible actually calls us to, to make a step forward in faith, then she was able to do that and she started being actually more helpful to the people than she had been before. You know, we need to be faithful to the things that we know to be true. And so uh, today, maybe some of these things are new for you. Um, it's, it's very clear, you know, God doesn't want us to be confused. And particularly in the end times that we're living in just before Jesus comes back, he wants to, fo he wants to gather his people to follow him in truth. If, uh, if you would like more information about this, then, uh, then I encourage you to make contact with us. We can give you some more study guides if you would like. And uh, I hope you can stay with us for the next program, which uh, is entitled The Secret to Success. You can contact us here if you live in these regions, um, in the greater Parramatta region or the eastern suburbs of Sydney or central or eastern suburbs, then contact us here and we'd be happy to, uh, to make contact with you and provide those uh, things for you. And uh, I'll see you soon for the next program, which is The Secret to Success. Okay, welcome back again. And uh, we continue on with our very final program. And uh, the very final topic is entitled The Secret to Success. When we look at the ancient code of Hammurabi, there's a list of 282 rules there outlining the code of conduct for ancient Babylon. There are various strange laws you could say there, uh, like this one here, if a woman had brought about the death of her husband because of another man, they shall impale that woman on stakes. Uh, that's law 153. Uh, we um, read there also that religious life for the Babylonians revolved around sacrifices and prayers to their gods. Ancient writings also demonstrate a feeling of disillusionment among the worshippers. Um, and uh, they asked themselves, is this religion working? Uh, they also wrote things like, you know, I try hard all day to serve my God, but what does it really do for me? You know, when we look at that, that's what the ancient Babylonians were saying. But today, many Christians are like the Babylonians of old. And I wonder whether that's why Revelation also refers to the confused religions out there as Babylon. And, uh, you know, people wonder whether their worship actually means anything at all today. Is there a secret to success that enables Christians to live a happy and effective Christian life, this abundant life that Jesus spoke about? In 1 John 5 verse 12, John writes, He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. So is Christ in your life? Uh, is he part of uh, your everyday journey, or is he kind of just head knowledge for you? You know, there's a difference between what a Christian believes and what a Christian does. You know, does your belief follow through in your actions and in your everyday life? The true motivation, really, for being a Christian is the love of God, the love of Christ, according to 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14, is the love of Christ that compels us and uh, it tells us in john 6 verse 63 that the holy spirit is key to having this uh, this life this spirit-filled life this abundant life that jesus promised us in uh, in that passage it says it is the spirit who gives life the flesh profits nothing so the holy spirit is a key or vital part of the life of a Christian in order to live this, uh, this abundant, uh, fulfilled life. So the Holy Spirit 
always points us to Jesus. The Holy Spirit never points to itself, if you like. The Holy Spirit always points us to Jesus. And uh, the scriptures tell us that the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin, meaning what is wrong with our life, and then it leads us into truth. The Holy Spirit also empowers us as we, as we follow the Lord in obedience. He empowers us with spiritual gifts. So it is the Holy Spirit then that changes our hearts and uh, it enables us then uh, to, to follow through and produce what the Bible calls the fruit of the Spirit. So if you really want to live the life that Jesus spoke about, a fulfilled Christian life, then each day you need to ask for an infilling of the Holy Spirit. It is a daily uh, baptism, if you like, a daily infilling that we need of the Holy Spirit to live a true, fulfilled Christian life. Now, what did Jesus say was this secret? In, G in John 15, verse 4, uh, Jesus spoke about being connected, okay? He said, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. So the, the key is to be connected to Jesus through the Holy Spirit. And there is only one way that uh, the Christian can really live this fulfilled life. We need to plug into the source of power, plug in and remain connected to, to Jesus. So uh, how do we do that? We need to communicate with God and God communicates with us in various different ways. He helps us in different ways. The first point here is that we need to study the Bible. Each day we need to be empowered by the Word of God that communicates to us. This is, if you like, God's uh, love message to us. It is God's message that we need to connect to each day and He speaks to us through the Word. Uh, secondly, through prayer. That's the way also that we communicate with God through prayer. We need to have time where we speak to God. We need to have time where God can impress our hearts and our minds and speak to us. And the third point here is that we need to exercise our faith in sharing this news that, that God has given to us, this truth that God has given to us. So God communicates through us to other people as we share the good news of the gospel. So in Romans 10, verse 17, we read then, so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So as we study the Bible, our faith increases as we allow God to speak to us. We, uh, we benefit spiritually, if you like, as we regularly study and, uh, and, and get into God's word the Bible. So as I mentioned, you know, the Bible is God's love letter to us. It's, uh, it, it's, it's the roadmap, if you like, the GPS, if you like, to salvation, to the kingdom and to the heart of God. So what is the most effective way to study the Bible? We need to, we need to uh, understand its truths, its doctrines. It says here in John 7, verse 17, if anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine. So if we want to follow Christ, if we want to have this fulfilled life, we want to do God's will. We, we don't want to be at odds with God's will, but rather when we find out God's truth, uh, his doctrines, we want to follow them. So the Holy Spirit, the same one who inspired the writers of the Bible, is the one that helps us to understand as he reveals the truths from the word. And so that's why it's important that, uh, that when we study the Bible, we always uh, open it with a prayer and ask God for understanding. So next time we, uh, you, st you study the Bible, uh, ask yourself uh, some of these questions. You know, what is God saying to the people that the author was writing of? You know, whether it's John or whether it's Isaiah or, or Moses, whoever it was that was writing. What is God trying to say through that writer to the people uh, that he was communicating to? Then, as God's word is written for people of all ages, 
what is God trying to say to me through that word today? Then what does this passage tell me about myself? You know, what is it revealed to me about myself? And, uh, and lastly, what does it tell me about God? What new understanding can I, can I get from this word about God? It's good to ask those questions as we read, whether it just be one verse or a chapter, a passage. Uh, ask, you know, what is that? What is, what is God trying to tell me through this word? So, uh, and as we do that, we prayerfully study this word. Jesus himself understood the importance of prayer. In Luke 6, verse 12, we read, Now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And so if Jesus, who was perfect, focused his life on prayer, how much more then do we, who are you know, very much imperfect and in need of help, how much more do we need prayer in our life today? I think you would agree that we certainly need to be praying and praying more. And so the secret to experiencing this abundant life is a prayerful life. Um, in Matthew 6, verse 6 and 7, Jesus said, But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. You know, we need to have a special place where we can go and spend some quiet time in prayer with God. We also read there that when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do. Um, it's, it's interesting that, you know, in many faiths today, uh, people may have a certain... Um, ritualistic sort of prayer or, or a phrase or something like that and they may just repeat it over and over and over and over and over again well Jesus said don't pray like that because that's how the heathens pray okay um, so God wants us to uh, to pray with an open heart true prayer is really not difficult just we need to open our heart to God as, as you would to a friend God wants us to commune with him like like um, like a friend, uh, even though he is God, he wants to have this connection with us. So uh, as uh, as we live this abundant life, then sharing the gospel, sharing the good news that you yourself has experienced, becomes a part of your life as well. In Matthew twenty four verse fourteen, we read that the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. And I think we're certainly living in a day where we could say that the gospel can indeed go to the ends of the earth. Some places even that you cannot go, you can go into digitally today, can't you? Whether it be through the internet or through radio or through print media, whatever it may be, you know, today we live in a day where the gospel can indeed go to the ends of the earth. And uh, when that happens, the Bible says that then the end will come and Jesus will return. So our life really should be a witness to people, not just through the words we speak, but through our actions, through the way that we live our life. We should conduct ourselves in the right way. We need to live our lives uh, in obedience to the Lord. And so how should a Christian live in terms of their character and their conduct? In 1 Peter 1 verse 15, it says, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in your conduct. So God calls us to a higher standard, doesn't he? God doesn't want us to remain uh, in the same state that we were before we were a believer. But rather, as the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, the Spirit convicts us of certain things and draws us to a higher level to be holy because God is holy. What spiritual advice did Paul give to the Christians, for instance, in Rome? In uh, the book of Romans, chapter 12, verse 2, we read, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Today we find that many people in their faith are trying to be just like the world. 
And if, in effect, they're really offering nothing new apart from maybe a set of beliefs. But no, God is calling us to a different life. He wants us to be transformed, not to be conformed to the world. Uh, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. said, we are called to be people of conviction, not conformity, of moral nobility, not social respectability. We are commanded to live differently and according to a higher loyalty. In many cases, people today in trying to be attractive to, to people, uh, they lower their standards. But, you know, when we look at the teachings of Jesus, Jesus actually raises the bar, doesn't he? For instance, you know, when, uh, when Jesus spoke about adultery, he, uh, he said, you know, you don't have to actually go through with, the, with, with adultery, but rather, you know, even if you think it in your mind, then it's, you've already committed that sin. It's like Jesus is raising the bar. And today we, we live in a world where we're surrounded by, um, we're living in a very sexualized world, aren't we? And so this is certainly pertinent to our day today. We need to be in a place where we can raise the bar rather than lower the bar. We need to say no to certain things that will pull us out into the world and make us no different to the world. As believers, there are things that we need to be able to say no to. So what specific aspects of the world, for instance, should a Christian avoid? There are many different things that we could cover, but we're only going to cover some here today. It says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 and 16, do not love the world or the things of the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And so God calls us again to a higher standard. You know, don't be pulled by peer pressure to just do the things that everyone else is, is doing, but rather have a higher standard in your life. Uh, this clothing brand here, SMP, uh, markets basically sex, money, and power. And, uh, you know, the secular influences of the world often revolve around these three, three things, don't they? Sex, money, and power. These are the things that, uh, that the scriptures talk about that we should uh, be wary of. What other things should, uh, should occupy the, the minds of Christians? You know, the Bible doesn't just tell us uh, these things are wrong, don't do them. But the Bible also tells us these things are right. You can do these, you know, do more of this and less of that. And so the Holy Spirit can lead us or guide us into that truth. And so Paul writes here in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. So, you know, this basically covers the plethora of different things that we could be doing in our lives from, you know, the things that we watch on the television to the movies that we watch to the places that we go and hang out with, uh, you know, we need to guard our minds from certain things, don't we, in, in today's world. And so we need to spend time thinking, doing, reading uh, things that are of good report. You know, you may not be what you think you are, but what you think you are. Maybe I'll say that again. You may not be what you think you are, but you, but sorry, but what you think you are. Uh, so it's important what our mind dwells on, what we allow into our mind, whether it be through our eyes, through our ears, uh, etc., into our lives. What sort of uh, <clears throat> Christians receive the grace of God? Now, this is important because James 4 verse 6 says, but that God gives more grace, more grace. He gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud that gives grace to the humble. You know, pride is one of the things that God really dislikes. Uh, and so if we are humble enough to recognize that we need God's help, then he is abundant in the, in the grace that he gives us. And uh, of course, grace is power, isn't it? Uh, 
So what about our financial management? Um, in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7, uh, Paul writes, So let each one of you give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. So the Bible even touches our hip pocket, doesn't it? And uh, in Malachi chapter 3, verse 8, we read, Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, In what have we robbed you? And the response there is, in tithes and in offerings. So, you know, God gives us life. He uh, blesses us with work, with health, with the ability to work, with a sound mind, etc. And he doesn't ask for much in return, but he does ask for tithes and offerings. And so tithes really are a test of our loyalty, of our honesty, whereas offerings is a is a test, if you like, of our generosity, okay? Are you a generous person or are you a stingy person? So um, what about marriage and family? In Hebrews 13, verse 4, we read that marriage is honourable uh, among all people. And so if we go back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, we read there that a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So the Bible has a standard for marriage as well. And so we need to follow that standard, the standard for a family, the standard for a marriage. God has designed the family from the very start uh, for love, to be love. And, uh, and so God has a, uh, a way that we should uh, be obedient in that respect there as well. Um, what about the things that we put on, the, the way that we dress? In 1 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, it says here, In like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety and moderation, not with braided or hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but with good works. Today I think that could just as well apply to the men as well as well as to the women, couldn't it? And so, you know, we need to uh, be modest in, in the things that we're wearing and not going over the top. Uh, in Hosea, for instance, it talks about jewellery even. He says, I will punish her for the days of the bales to which she burnt incense. She decked herself with earrings and jewellery and went after her lovers, but me she forgot. You know, sometimes we more interested in how we look and how people perceive us rather than following God uh, loyally. And so we need to submit to God. According to James 4, verse 7, we need to submit. Uh, resist the devil and he will flee from you. So if we want to overcome something in our life, it's not like we need to, you know, cry hard or grit our teeth and say, you know, I'm going to do it if it kills me. No. God wants to give us his grace to, to help us in time of need and in times of temptation as we face a world around us that has all sorts of things pulling us in different directions. God wants to help us in various aspects of our lives to, to live this abundant life, this, uh, this joyful life that he wants to give to us. So as Christians, you have all the power, friends, all the power in the universe to overcome sin and temptation by God's grace. Not by your own uh, you know, strength, but by God's grace. God's grace is powerful. It, 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 you know, God's grace is basically the power to, to help you. Um, some years ago, I, um, I was privileged enough to, to baptize a man who... Uh, who had been involved in various different things. You know, when you listen to his story, it is amazing. He, uh, he said uh, to me, Daniel, I have, been, uh, I have been surrounded by wealth and opulence and luxury to the greatest capacity. The people that I mixed with had everything this world could ever offer. And also I have found myself in the gutter as a drug addict. Uh, this man had been involved in the underworld and uh, had, uh, had been involved in some, some crazy, crazy things here in, in Australia. But uh, interestingly, you know, he grew up, he didn't really know God at all. He, he knew nothing about God for decades of his life. Uh, but then um, as he shares his, uh, his, uh, his story, 
he shares how, you know, at various times in his life, he's, he loves flying and um, he's crashed <laughs> either a plane or a helicopter. He's crashed five times. Can you believe it? And walked away. He survived five times. I, I told him that he should be in the Guinness book of records, but uh, you know, clearly God was protecting him, even though he was doing things that were very risky and, he could have been killed many times over, but God protected him uh, because God knows the end from the beginning. And, uh, and so this man eventually, while, went, once he was in his 50s, he begins to, uh, to do a search and uh, he came across the good book and he came across the, the teachings of the Bible. And, uh, you know, this man, um, he's one of few people that I've met that he said, you know, um, I never knew this, but now that I've read it in the Bible, now that I understand this is what God wants me to do, it's easy. I just follow it. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and so he just, he, he makes changes in his life. He makes drastic changes in his life. And today he's a very, very happy man. Um, he's a fit man. He, he used to be quite unfit. You know, he tries to surf regularly and uh, he still loves flying. And uh, today he, he's, he's into music as well. And he says, the Holy Spirit and I, we, we write songs together. And so God's grace has turned this man's life around from, from a life uh, of a criminal, uh, a life of, of, of drugs and abuse, to a life of health, of joy. He's living the abundant life. And uh, if you were ever able to meet him, he is he's one of the most happiest men that, uh, that you could meet. And so that's what God wants for you. God loves you with an everlasting love. In Jeremiah 31 verse 3, the Bible tells us here that the Lord has appeared of old to me saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. And so God draws each one of us. He, uh, he loves us from uh from the very beginning from before you were even born uh from beginning to end the bible is really about god's love message for mankind what uh what god wants to do in and through you what god wants to do for you god wants to be with you forever and so my friends as we come to the end of this series my prayer for you is that you will submit to god that, uh, that you will give your life, your heart to Jesus because he loves you with an everlasting love. No greater love has anyone than the Lord does for you. He was willing to sacrifice his life for you to give you eternal life. You just need to take hold of it and say, Lord, I will follow you. May that be your desire and your decision today. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, as we have covered many different aspects of what is in your scriptures. There is much more that we could have looked at, but we have just skimmed over these things and, uh, and presented them in the time that we have here. But Lord, most of all, we thank you. We want to thank you for your love, for your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness. We thank you that you give us a, a second chance in life uh, to wipe the slate clean, give us a fresh new start. And we pray, Lord, that as we take hold of that, that you will keep us from the beginning to the end and that we have nothing to be concerned about because, Lord, you who have started a good thing in us, you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, uh, it's time to say farewell. I'm hoping to have various other uh, probably shorter series uh, that, that I'll be making. But uh, in regards to this series, if you would like the study guides that, uh, that come along with today, we covered why so many churches and steps, uh, the secrets to success. Uh, it actually comes in a, a, a folder with, with all 24 guides in it. And so if that's something that you would like and, uh, and if you are living in our area where we can uh, make contact with you, then please do contact us here, info at paramattacentral.org.au or info, info at wallarachurch.org. 
and uh, we'll be more than happy to make contact with you. Take care and God bless. May uh, you live the abundant life and the eternal life that God intends for each one of us.